than the brother should seem vile unto thee. heaven, Lord, we come before you here right now, Lord, we thank you for the worship service, for the opportunity to come before you and to be in your house, and Lord, to have your presence with us. Lord, I pray that you'll be with me as I, as I present this morning, Lord, that your words would be with me. Lord, you know that I cannot present of my own self, Lord. Father, I pray for the, the people here, Lord, that they will be blessed as well. Lord, in, in you and through you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so... It's an unusual uh, scripture reading this morning. <laughs> and um, this is unlike any kind of a message that I have presented before. There will be no PowerPoint today, so uh, you'll have to... Uh, just follow along with the quotes here in the text. I am going to give you some citations if you want to follow. I'm going to start by telling you a story. Phoebe Ann Moses, born August 13, 1860, to Quaker parents in Ohio. Her family was very, very poor. Her father died at five years of age. The family was so poor that she could not attend school regularly. And at age 10, she was bonded out to a family for two years to help care for their infant son. She endured physical and mental abuse, and after two years, she ran away. In her autobiography, she called the family that she was bonded out to. That was basically like, uh, like indentured servitude, right? Two years she was there, she called them the wolves. And she refused to identify who they were. Because well, perhaps you'll see. At the age of seven, to help pay the bills, she began running a trap line in the forest. She would take the animals that she caught and she would sell them to the, the, the grocery store or the uh, fur producer. At age eight, she began shooting. She would shoot animals in the forest and sell the game to local shop owners to help pay the bills. When she was 15 years old, a traveling sharpshooter by the name of Frank E. Butler came to the town that she lived in. And this man was a competitive uh, shooter with a gun, with a rifle, pistols. And he challenged everybody in the district. He put up a standing bet. In today's currency, it was about $2,600. And he said, I will bet you that I can beat any person in this district. And this man heard about the bet, and he went to Phoebe. And Phoebe was five feet tall and 15 years old. And she entered in the competition, and she beat Frank E. Butler. <laughs> and he lost his money, and he lost the bet but he gained a wife because a short time later they were married. And they, they began to tour together and she took the name Annie Oakley. Annie Oakley was a marvel and she could split a playing card from 30 paces on its edge. They would hold it up like this and she would shoot it. Her husband would take a cigar and put it in his hand or in his mouth, and she would shoot the ashes off of that cigar. She performed for royalty in various parts of the world. In fact, at one point, uh, I think it was Kaiser Wilhelm 
wanted to see the trick with the ashes and he held a cigar in his hand and she shot the, the ashes off the cigar. So she was a remarkable shot. In 1903, two Chicago newspapers belonging to uh, media mogul William Randolph Hearst published an entirely false article about Annie Oakley. <clears throat> the title to the article, uh, released on August 11, 1903, was Famous Woman Crack Shot Steals to Secure Cocaine. The story said that Oakley had been sentenced to 45 days in a Chicago prison for stealing the trousers off a man in order to get money so that she could buy cocaine. The article said that her beauty had vanished, and though she is but 28 years old, she looks almost 40. <clears throat> How many of you have heard of William Randolph Hearst? How many of you have been to any of his homes? All right, some of you have. I was to one of his homes uh, many years ago. I was a kid in California. It's called the Hearst Castle. And it's high up on a hill, and it is surrounded with Greek figurines and Roman like fig statues, like authentic statues that he brought over from Europe. And it is the most opulent, most excessive, place that I have ever been in. It, there is gold everywhere. There is tapestries and massive ceilings and swimming pools and just the money is just, the, the, the opulence is incredible. But that opulence comes at a price because it was through running, in part, salacious newspaper ad, uh, stories that he gathered that fortune. In other words, it was through defaming somebody in part, that he got his kingdom. Well, Annie Oakley uh, was not a cocaine user. But how do you prove that to the world when all of the newspapers in the country are covering a story about you stealing somebody's trousers so that you can buy cocaine? In fact, she wasn't even in Ohio at the time. She was in New Jersey. What to do? Well, she started lawsuits. She started to sue, and she sued 55 times, and uh, as far as I know, she won 54 cases. I don't know what happened to the 55th, maybe it's settled. But the point is, is that she had to go to an extreme effort to try and clear her name. There was no way to do it. And we know that despite the fact that she won 54 lawsuits against the paper, she recovered far less than her legal fees. So in other words, it cost her more than what she gained. You know, the original slanderer is Satan. The original defamer is Satan. Because originally, in heaven, he told a story about God. He spun a web about God. And there was no court that God could go to. He couldn't just sue Satan to shut him up. Now, how do you fight slander and defamation? How do you make it go away? The fact is, is that Satan hates God, and he told lies about God, until finally there was war in heaven, and a third of the angels were thrown out with Satan, who is the accuser. But still the lies were not fixed. The question mark remained. The accusations from Satan about God remained. And God has been fighting to clear his name in heaven and here on this earth for 6,000 years. He has been fighting. And it has been a hard battle. But it has cost him dearly to fight. Now, I have been studying the doctrine of eternal torment. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that this is false. But there's a whole world out there that does not know that this is a false message. 
And I think that in our church sometimes we gloss over this. We shrug our shoulders about the doctrine of eternal torment because we say, well, you know, we know it's false. We don't, we don't pay it any mind whatsoever. But there are billions of people on this planet who believe that God is a sadist. And I want you to think about the monstrosity of the lie. Because this is part of Satan's lie against God. And if you are going to evangelize people about the gospel in the back of every single person's mind that you meet, I guarantee you, is this question about what God does with the people who are finally impenitent with the wicked. What does he do with them? What has he done with my mother, my father, my brother, my uncle, my friend? This question, I guarantee you, the person at the supermarket that you speak to, this question is in their mind. So how do you address it? Or should you address it? Because I think, like I said, we just gloss over it these days. We know it's not true. And we take for granted that it's not true. But you have to put yourself into the minds of the person who thinks this. <clears throat> The lie is that the God who you are being asked to pray to, the lie is that the God who you are being asked to believe in, the, the God who says that he is a loving God, in some dark corner of the universe, in some dark place, he tortures people, lots of people, forever and ever and ever. And not that he is going to do that, but that he is doing it, okay? Because all these people have died. Where are they? They're in hell, according to a lot of people. And you've heard the sermons from some of these people who have converted to the Adventist church about their early childhood in the Baptist faith, in the Catholic faith, right? In the Pentecostal faith. And the conclusion that they reached early on, that if this God, if that's true, I want nothing to do with him. I don't want anything to do with him. Because the insinuation from Satan is so strong, right? How can you trust him? How can you ever trust somebody? Think about your friend who you love. You love to hang out with that person. But down the street, in the backyard, in a shed somewhere, this person is torturing the cats in the neighborhood. Every time he catches a cat, he tortures it in the shed for hours and hours and hours. If you found that out, what would you do? They wouldn't be my friend anymore. They wouldn't be your friend anymore, whether you like cats or not. How could you be friends with this individual? Right? It would be impossible because you would have a question about who they are. Right? And that's just for, just for a few hours. If you found out that somebody who you knew was torturing animals, even for 10 minutes, it'd be friends off. And it'd be a call to the police. Amen. Right? Amen. Okay. But this is a doctrine which says that God, in some place that you cannot see, and that makes the lie so much more pernicious, right? So much more difficult to address. Because it's happening in a place that you can't see. How does God disprove that he's not doing this? You want to come into my house? Go ahead. Look around. Have a look around the whole universe. Right? Is there any place? Well, you could be hiding it. You're God. How do you combat that lie? And this is what so many people believe. How do you fight it? The idea that the loving God who formed man from the dust of the earth. Right? You can see God stooping down to form Adam out of the dust. In fact, Adam's very name means dust. To form him out of the dust. To lovingly craft him. right, And then to take his children and do this to them for all eternity. right? The God that you pray to. The God that lifted the prostitute from the dirt. And told her, I forgive you, right? Go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. This is the same God. How could it be the same God? 
I've been having discussions with a Baptist friend of mine. This person has been a, a friend of mine for some years. And uh, I won't say if it's a girl or a, boy, a man or a woman. It's not the point. Uh, to safeguard their identity. This person who I know, who's a good friend of mine, we have had many discussions on this subject. And this person always shies away from the discussion to some extent. Sure. And, and the response that I get to all of the arguments, to all of the texts, to all of the scriptures is God is sovereign. Who are you to question God? How can you in your finite, you are only a man, how can you say that this is wrong of God to do? How can you say that this is improper? Because I said at one point to this person, I said, if that was true about God and I found out about it, I would not follow that person anymore. How could you ever follow that person? And, the, and, and my friend's response to me is, well, you're on very dangerous footing then because God is sovereign. Who are you to question God? You could see the trouble here Right? With this argument. Sure. At the beginning, Satan says, Satan is the one who says, sure, God's all-powerful. Of course. He's all-powerful. He can do whatever he wants, and he does. And who are you to question him? We've never questioned him before. You know, maybe it's time that we ask a few questions. Maybe things don't add up. You know, but he's sovereign, he's the one who's in charge. I mean, is not this the original lie? So when a, when a Christian says to you, I don't, how many of you have had these conversations with people? Okay, I'm telling you right now, the point of this sermon is, is that as Seventh-day Adventists, we are apologists for the character of God. Amen. What is an apologist? An apologist is somebody who fights for the reputation of somebody. And we are an apologist for God. And so, you know, in the town that, that uh, I'm in sometimes, there's a guy on the street corner, and he's, he looks crazy. And he will stand on the street corner for an hour until he just about passes out, and then he sits down. And he literally screams his message about eternal torment. I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm scared of that guy. He's crazy. You know? But somebody has to go talk to him. And that somebody is me. I haven't done it yet. Where did this idea come from? And what is to be done about it? Can we just shrug our shoulders and say, well, this is how it is. Now, like I said, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation for you tonight. But I want to um, go through some of the arguments, some of which you would be surprised about with respect to this doctrine. I'm reading a book right now called The Fire That Consumes. And it's written by a Baptist preacher and lawyer. And a movie was made about him called Hell and Mr. Fudge. And you can get this book, Hell, uh, The Fire That Consumes, and you, you can and should read it because it's very interesting. Um, and it will teach you certain things about the disbelief and how to combat it, because this man came to the point where he did not believe in the doctrine of eternal torment as a Baptist, and he wrote this book. In the book, he quotes an author by the last name of Shedd, who makes the argument, and you'll see here, and as you know, some of you know, that the doctrine of eternal torment really hinges on two ideas, right? That when the Bible talks about eternity or eons or, you know, forever, that that word is faithfully translated into English and has the exact meaning that it had when the original writers wrote it down. And I'm not going to get into that argument as, except for to say that repeatedly in the scriptures, the example used when it says eternal fire or eternal, uh, eternal punishment that it's talking about the eternity of the punishment, right? In other words, that the result is final, Amen. right? 
that the conclusion is done. And the scripture reading that we read today uh, is an unusual one. And it's talking about if there is a man and he is brought before the judges, if, you, if that man is found guilty, the judge can take that man and he can have him beaten in front of his face. But you can't beat him indefinitely. Right? The law of Moses says that you can beat him, you can hit him 40 times, but you cannot hit him 41 times. Because if you hit him 41 times, it will make him seem vile in everybody else's eyes. And so it is God's law from the very beginning is opposed to the idea of a disproportionate punishment. Right? God is a God of justice, and he says... You know, even in human circumstances, the maximum times, time, no matter what this man has done, right? There, is, there are times where you can have the death penalty, right? There were specific circumstances that were set out. But the maximum amount of, of times that you can hit a man as a punishment in front of the judge is 40 times. Does that sound like a God who would then turn around after giving this law to Moses and say, but on the sidelines here, I can burn somebody forever and ever and ever. It's totally contrary to the scripture. Amen. So this is the second part of the argument. The second part of the argument is that because man has an immortal soul, that he has to exist. Therefore, he either is in heaven or he's in hell. Right? If he's in heaven, fine. But if he's in hell, he's there forever, right? Now, just listen to what this uh, what this author says. This is from the, the Doctrine of Endless Punishment, page 490. The author's name is Shed. You can look this up. The doctrine of man's immortality means that every frail and finite man is to be as long enduring as the infinite and eternal God. That there will be no more an end to the existence of the man who died than there will be of the deity who made him. So you see how what he's saying is that the life of man, because God made the man, is that, is, that, is that his life runs for eternity. God is denominated the ancient of days, but every mortal spirit that ever dwelt in a human body will also be an ancient of days. Yes, man must exist. He has no option. Necessity is laid upon him. He cannot extinguish himself. He cannot cease to be. This is what they believe that you have no choice. Now, of course, we know that that contradicts numerous passages in the Scriptures. 1 Timothy 6.16 says that God alone has immortality. Genesis chapter 5, verse 7. Uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 3, verse 22 says that when Adam fell, God said to the angels and to uh, the Godhead, let us exclude man from the garden, lest he take forward, reach forward his hand to the tree of life and take that fruit and eat of it and live forever. So you see that man is not immortal, right? Naturally immortal. That man, when man fell, when Adam made a son, Adam's son was made in his image. It was not made in God's image. That's what the Bible says. That's Genesis chapter 5, verse 7. That when man, when Adam had a son. He made his son in his own image, not in the image of God. Now, why am I talking about this? We all know this. The reason I'm talking about it is because we need to be a lot more excised about this. Amen. We need to remember that when we speak to people, we take for granted that God is not a sadist. But they believe that he does this. And you have to get past that when you present to people. You have to give them something. You have to talk to them. You have to plant the seed. How do you combat disinformation, misinformation? How do you combat slander? If somebody slandered the pastor and I wanted to combat it, I would say to the person who repeated the story about him, I would say, yeah, but that I know him personally. He's not like that. Look at what the book about him says, right? I know him. He would never do that. You have to plant that seed. If we don't plant the seed, there is no alternative in their mind. 
right? And it is a hard fight. I have had this friend with my Baptist friend for years, off and on. Right now it's off, because I told her in no uncertain terms, I said, I'm not the one with the problem. You're the one with the problem. You're the one who has an issue. I said, I don't have a problem. You think that somehow it's justifiable for the eternal God, who is a God of love, who sent His only Son to die for humanity. You want me to believe that that same God has a place where He torments people and tortures them for eternity, bubbling, shrieking, writhing, screaming, the person hates it when I say this. I always do this. I always do this. I always say, and after a trillion years, your torment has just begun. I'm not the one with the problem. You have a problem. Because you somehow square that with his sovereignty. I don't have that problem because the Bible doesn't teach that. Amen. The person's very upset with you. Person's upset with me. <clears throat> a lot of people, in fact, I was dumbfounded to learn this. And that's why I'm talking about this today. A lot of people do not realize that Martin Luther did not believe in the immortality of the soul. How many of you knew that? You know... But it's a fact. I'm going to read you what Luther thought about this. Um, Luther rejected the philosophical doctrine of the soul's innate immortality. This is on page 70 of The Fire That Consumes. In one vehement outburst against Rome's traditions following a public burning of his books, Luther classed the immortality of the soul among the, quote, monstrous fables that form part of the Roman dunghill of decretals. So he's saying it's a pile of poo. And he's right. He's right. That's what Martin Luther says. Now, I think that that's important for Protestants to know. Amen. William Tyndale did not believe in the immortality of the soul. The person who translated the King James Version of the Bible. Well, no. The person who's... Uh, or, let me back up. William Tyndale... His, his translation into the English language, which, we, which he lost his life for, and which uh, 76, between 76 and 87 percent of the King James Version of, of the Bible is William Tyndale's work and the people who worked with him. William Tyndale did not believe in the immortality of the soul. I mean, in a conversation with, with fellow Protestants, you ought to be able to just hold the mic out and drop it. Okay? I mean, that's huge. So how is it that the Protestant world embraced this doctrine? Right? We know how it came into the Catholic Church. It comes through the Greeks. It comes through Aristotle. It comes through Plato. Plato and Aristotle taught that man is a dualism. He has his body and he has his soul. And when his body dies, his soul continues. Right? That is Greek teaching. That's paganism. From that doctrine, they get the immortality of the soul. Uh, uh, from uh, the eta uh, eternal torment. Eternal torment. They get the doctrine of eternal torment. Right? So that comes from Greeks. Then it comes to the Roman pagans. They believe the same thing. Then it comes to the Roman Catholic Church. Right? Because so much of Roman paganism and Greek paganism came into the Roman Catholic Church. And they taught that as fact. But how did it get into the Protestant world if Martin Luther taught what's called Christian mortalism, right? That man, when he 